Dr. Richard C. Miller, your work, again, anyone watching, seriously get resurrection and reception in early Christianity, I'm pushing him, don't worry, to make a more popular level, non-academic book that really gets his uh, whole position out there into a broader audience, because um, it's it's your, your stuff's dense, but it's very, very highly intellectual and very powerful material. I live in a different world. You do. You live in what I call the ivory tower scholarly world, where yeah. you, you know, you talk to each other through your works. Whereas I deal with the everyday mom, pop, sister, brother, people who are struggling with life and have faith, and some don't have faith. Faith has traumatized some. Some that's helped. Whatever. And a lot of these Christians um, will look to Richard Bauckham, Craig Evans. Um, they're looking to Mike Lacona. What can we find that they get an accurate geographical place? So they they understand, uh, uh, they have some verisimilitude. The gospels seem to have verisimilitude. They talk about people, they're real people. A Caiaphas, we found his tomb. Uh, you know, we know where his, his ossuary is. It's in the Israel Museum. I saw it when I was there. Um, like, like <laughs> here are these people, places, things that make it look kind of real. Um, hmm. So you, Mr. Miller, I'm pointing at you like, hey, you, Mr. Miller, how dare you not recognize that these are historical uh, books that are giving you accurate what happened? Now, they make a leap. And another leap you, to you and me, we would obviously not find this an accurate leap, but they make the leap that some mundane piece of information that might be factual about a place, a person or something, then you can go, well, we could trust it. Now angels are flying everywhere and dead bodies are coming out of graves and like all sorts of stuff like that is happening. And they kind of somehow go, now it's just human. See, you just deny miraculous events and that's why you can't accept these accounts. Mm. But they use the verisimilitude argument to give credibility to saying, you can trust uh, this guy we call Mark because Mark knows about a place called Capernaum in Galilee or yeah. you know Philippi or something. What are your thoughts about the verisimilitude argument to try and bring validity, historical reliability or validity to these texts? Yeah, this is not footage of live first century ontological events. Um, it, the use of verisimilitude in the ancient world was commonplace. Uh, in fact, we would be surprised not to find it there. Um, I, I would put back to them. I, I don't know the individuals of, of whom you speak for the most part. Uh, I would put back to them, hey, let's, how about trotting out a list of other exceptions? You know, where, where do we find, let's see, how, let's put it this way. Where do we find any major or well-known text from classical antiquity that does not apply verisimilitude, that's inventive and fictive? Like, let's use Homer. Yeah. I always like to go to book 10 because it's the wee passages. And sure, there's differences between what Acts is doing in this 8th century BC, 7th century BC book, huh. um, the Odyssey. But in book 10, he talks about the Aeolian Island and Aeolus and, and all of this like real detail. They go into some real ex very, very detailed discussions, but we all categorize it as poetry and it fits into this ancient literature that's fictive right yet the aeolian islands are real the sea is legit these are real places some people that are mentioned in these books troy we think is an actual place that really existed and they've built a legend a uh, fictive legendary tale surrounding these places so you're suggesting that like Maybe they can find a list, and it's going to be very short, that has no verisimilitude to reality and it's fictive. Would you say that that's kind of an anachronistic thing to say, well, we have Lord of the Rings or we have some like non, like Game of Thrones. I love it, but right. it takes place on a completely different planet. It's not even yeah. our. Yeah, yeah. So Lucian's True Lies is, is a fantasy written in the second century. He's actually making a mockery of, of other writings in some ways in doing so. It's a raw fantasy, though. I mean, you've got all sorts of things, ants going up to the moon and all kinds of wild, you know, it's it's clearly not meant to be taken in any other way than as fantasy. OK, um, kind of science fiction, almost so like the precursor to that in some way. Yeah. Um, now, that's that's an exception. That's one one exception. Right. But it's a fantasy world. Right. 
that kind of writing was alien to the ancient world for the most part. You had, you know, if you want to talk about um, the metamorphosis, right, where you've got this uh, fellow who is transformed into a donkey and he walks around the Roman Empire and has encounters with people and all sorts of things happen. It's set in historical context. There's actual places and names and things like this going on. This is normal, right? This is kind of the normal way that you would present. And there would normally be a map as well. You know, if you look at the Odyssey, you could see a map. You know, you could you could lay out the map. There's scholars that you could go online right now and Google map of the Odyssey, you know, Odysseus's journey. And you could see, oh, that's the actual Mediterranean, you know, <laughs> sea and, and real islands and so forth, just like you point out. Um, Which so makes me think of Acts and Paul's journey, these real islands and stuff. Right. Like Okay. These kind of arguments actually anger me in some way, and <laughs> forgive me for this, but what even is a legend? You know, is it, if it's not defined as kind of the nexus between a, a real contextualized, you know, usually a, a actual person in history who, who upon that person is, uh, upon whom is placed tall tales and embellishments, and this kind of thing. That's what a legend is, right? It's kind of the combination. It's not pure myth. It's myth that is set in a historical context and applied to a possibly or someone who might be supposed to be a historical person. And so now you could you could say that there are some legends that are ahistorical, like if you're talking about Paul Bunyan or something like that. Romulus might fit that too. Yeah, exactly. But they were playing in their minds with, is this guy real? They actually had his house there in, in Rome. You could go to it, you know. Yeah. Uh, they actually had, uh, you know, they had evidence that, that they supposed that this person was actually a historical person. So they were playing with the idea anyway. Um, and so that's what a legend is. It's, uh, you know... Uh, St. Patrick, we, we celebrate St. Patrick's Day in the United States here. For what? Does anyone know? You know, you could probably drive, you know, 100 miles from here and have a hard time finding anyone who actually knows who's the, the first thing about St. Patrick. Well, he's a legendary figure, a real person that went to, you know, went, went to Ireland and kind of, and he ridded the island of all the snakes through some magic of his and as a, you know, and, and this kind of thing. And, um, there's tall tales applied to him. The historical St. Patrick is all but lost to us. St. Nicholas, who is that person? You know, that's an extreme example in another direction. Mm -hmm. And so and you could fill in the gaps. We could sit here and list, you know, 500 legendary, you know, embellished figures in history. And it would be shocking to find one historical, um, you know, one figure from the ancient world who was elevated as a religious icon that had no embellishment, had no fiction applied, had no tall tales, no legend. You know, if you tra go over to Buddha or Zoroaster or you fill in the blank all across, the, uh, it, it, this is commonplace. The holy man in antiquity that rose to that kind of iconographic level. I mean, even yeah. Islam, right? Which likes to claim this idea like Muhammad is not out here performing all these miracles. They couldn't help but have him split the moon, fly on Pegasus to the moon, like right. uh, to heaven. I mean, like... There's, they couldn't even help it. And, and I mean, I'm not, that's anachronistic as well, because there's this assumption that they're so rational and philosophical minded that they, they didn't put him on son of God status. They had this really mundane guy. They have legends about their own person. So right. everybody's doing it. And I think it's really interesting. That the only people in the room for that discussion, the elephant in the room is the person standing there going, but this one's different. And it's not even different. In, in, they're only saying one strand of this one is different. If you look at the other permutations of Christianity that didn't make it into that one orthodox trajectory, like for, for instance, Manichaeanism, that's to the east. That's not towards the empire. That's toward Persia and India. Well, it's syncretizing with Indic and Parthian mythology and putting all that together into its own gumbo. And so they're nowhere in that. Do you find Jesus elevated as a, as son of God or demigod or ascension or virgin birth or any of that stuff? And so if you go to Egyptian permutations, like say the Gnostic traditions and these kinds of things, you end up with a whole nother kind of uh, recipe of how he's decorated there and, and dressed up in a certain way that makes sense in that milieu. So it's syncretic. It's trying to adopt the it's it's built on the bedrock or, or, or pulling in the myth, the mythic standards of the context whence it went 
And so it's a sec, it's, it's a syncretic project. So it's adopting and trying to, um, make this kind of gumbo with, uh, basically Greco Roman forms in the Hellenistic and Roman trajectory. And so that's what exactly what we find in, in the New Testament. So one comment as we bounce yeah. back to verisimilitude, and that is just, I have said, and I'm sure several before me have said this, but this has just been my observation. The reason that Christianity has been so successful using evolution as a model. I used to think, I used to think survival of the fittest meant the strongest will survive. And it's not about strongest. It's the one that is willing to adapt to its environment and change the most. Christianity, it can go any direction. I mean, you can have a black Jesus and a white Jesus, a Ku Klux Klan Jesus and an Afrocentric <laughs> Jesus. Like it will go anywhere you want it. And that's why it's, I think, was so successful mm. is that it will adopt and become whatever you wanted it to be. And this is as early as we can go, what Christianity was. And you brought it up to my attention. I've heard it before from several scholars in the past, but it's just the idea that they're even in the New Testament, the different voices are different community groups or at least different cultic observations and perceptions of Jesus competing with each other. And John, John has Thomas, of all people, have to touch Jesus. Why? Because in the Thomasine tradition, Jesus wasn't this corporeal, physical person. Right. He was a phantom of some sort. He had, you know, or depends on the, the tale that you might read. But they wanted to nail Thomas in a propagandistic way against the Thomasine Christians and say, hey, look, your dude even recognized. And I think they did that with John the Baptist followers in the, in the New Testament by going, look, even Jesus humbly said of women born, none greater than John. However, there's one greater than I, John says. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. can't even unloose his sandal. Like, so there's a, there's a propaganda to, to do this. And the real, t I, this is a psychological question. It always comes back to me wanting to psychoanalyze. And that's what sucks because the Christian buddies of mine that I talk to go, Derek, quit playing in our minds. You're trying to understand our, our brains and what we're doing. Stop it. We just need to have this real vigorous academic discussion of the details here. And I'm thinking to myself, how do you not see this as walking like a duck, talking like a duck? I just don't understand. So as a scholar, who once was like me, devout, and really, I'll use the word brainwashed, but I don't mean it derogatory, but I guess you can take it that way. I drank the Kool-Aid. Right. Like if my cult leader at the time would have poisoned it, I might have drank it. That's how nutty I was in this. And they may not be that, well, you were too deep. No wonder you're like you are today. What do you, how do you assess that in your observation of people out there that are claiming to want to do this historical work or really research in apologetics and they act like they really want to honestly engage in this material. But mm. I don't know how they can't see what I'm saying. I'm a little frustrated, as you can see. I'm, I'm very yeah. frustrated that, because these people are looking at me somewhat going, I'm honestly seeking and wanting to know. Right. And I'm going, but then how come you're not seeing this? Yeah, I have mixed feelings about that. I come out of it just like you. And so I have empathy for those folks in some ways. You right, know, I, okay. if, if that's your, it's where they started from. They weren't, like I said, in the, in the, in the depths of some library making study. You know, that's not where it all begins. It begins in a pew at a, an altar call, a sing along, a camp or whatever. You're, you're starting to get involved in this community. You're starting to construct, you know, organize your life around it starting to make sense, you're starting to believe and really, really feel like something's happening and this sort of thing. And that's where people get, they, they learn what the gospels are in that context. And it's hard to get out of that. It really is mentally hard to get out of that. And you have Miller and all these other people on your show that are saying, it's not that, it's not that. And really what you've got is this heavy theological set of goggles that are placed on you. When you first even get to make your investigation, your first impressions of what's going on there are with these goggles on. You know, you've got the glue of the book itself holding these diverse documents together as if they all are in concert in some way. As if, as if all these people got into a room somewhere and decided on having a similar or precisely aligned message or something like that. That's... That's a that that's something that wouldn't have existed in the ancient. These these documents circulated independently in the New Testament, particularly, and so the idea that and so that's a theological kind of assumption that you're fed right up front that it's hard to break out of. Which is why I think they fight night and day to try and, in my opinion, some of them 
want to nail Mark as Mark, Luke as Luke, Matthew as Matthew, John as John. They they want that patristic clout to dive back to the authorial being someone who's there, who witnessed the guy or talked to the witness or talked to the um. to the apostle or whatever. And they're dying on that hill. Uh, even right now, I've got a guy, uh, David Palaman. He's really a smart, really, I mean, he's read more than me, but I think he's read materials, more materials in a vein that isn't in the vein I'm reading in, but he's really well read. And I'd love to see him truly look at this stuff, but he's into the Matthean priority thing. And I feel like he, he wants to rely on the patristics because they give him the cloud of Matthean priority because it helps his apologetic. And I, I can't help but see it and think, well, he might think, well, you want Mark in priority because you want to see this mundane gospel help suit your little evolutionary view of the developing, you know, legendary stuff. And you have really no reason to think Mark is like the first gospel. And it just drives me a little bit nuts <laughs> sometimes. Man. Yeah. No, but I, I love I these people. It. I really do. It's just. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I think I think we have to, you know, understand that these are competing kind of uh, different currents of of the earliest tradition christianities as some people have, have talked about here at the claremont colleges there's not a single christianity there's christianities that are almost immediately arrayed if you read uh, one jesus many christ by gregory j Riley, it's a very interesting book i think you can still find it probably a used copy somewhere or something but maybe even still in print and that's his idea that there he he is a he does believe that there was a or, or conclude that there was a historical figure somewhere behind all of this, mm -hmm. but that almost he you know he says you know what did they do did they all just get into a room you know after Pentecost or whatever and you know put their hands together and say With okay let's agree yeah, <laughs> let's agree on the message now break and they all just distributed it out throughout the the Greco Roman world and had this lockstep message together. <laughs> Well, that's just not what we see in the messy evidence at all. We see co conflict, we see struggle, we see schools of thought, people trying to reconcile one school under under another and trying to in competing ideas. And so, um, it, I you know, it's hard to find a good analogy sometimes for that. I, I've thought about even like martial arts or something, you know, it, were they competing in the hard sense of hating one another? There might have been some of that going on as well. I think even between the Pauline folks and the or originary tradents in Palestine, you know, the, the so-called apostles or pillars as he mocks them, mm -hmm. you know, those, there's some, there's some stuff going on there. And I think we need to see those sparks that are flying there and, and recognize. But Acts shows them as singing Kumbaya. <laughs> anyway, there's yeah. so many yeah. interesting things you're saying. So I, I got us off track a little bit of my little vent session there. And, and I appreciate you listening. I feel like I'm having therapy right now. <laughs> uh, but the, the verisimilitude thing, the point is, is do some homework, check it out, go find us any text that don't have verisimilitude to geography, places, people, things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And you're just going to find that the overwhelming, you might find exceptions, of course, but it's like so, it's it's like your argument about the early church. And we might as well nail that real quick before <laughs> anyone runs further. I found something that sounds like in this guy who's named uh, Hashemaha, and we don't even know who the guy right. is, maybe some small dude on the side. And you're like, even if they found someone who tried to make what sounded like maybe some historiographical claim of the resurrection or something, right. it would be a rule or it would be an exception to the rule rather than being the rule itself that we see overall. Yeah, I think I think it even I mean, you can even make the case that it makes my my case even stronger. All you did. You mean that's all you found? Right. Out of all the breadth of ancient literature, you found one or two examples. That's not going to do it, right? Right. That that shouldn't persuade any rational person at that point. And I think that's the, the same here. If, if if someone were to trot forward a text that that was inventive or that that was fictional, but then also was devoid of of actual historical place names and and figures and and cities and whatever islands and maps and all that stuff, then it would be just that an exception. It wouldn't. It would not help the. It would actually help my case because what we would be saying is that that particular observation in the gospels is not an indicator one way or the other whether it's it's fiction or not so it's not helpful to the discussion thank you i hope you liked my dad richard miller in this interview remember to like and subscribe and never forget we are miss vision coming in the air tonight.